שבת שלום ומועדים לשמחה. שבת שלום ומועדים לשמחה. So don't worry, we're going to get out of this holiday season of different greetings very soon. Just once we get past next week, uh, then it all goes back to normal. And it'll just be a regular Shabbat Shalom. But in the meantime, there is much to consider. Uh, most importantly, of course, here on uh, this uh, beginning part of the holiday of Sukkot, the notion of Sukkot, the notion of having a Sukkah. Sukkot is, of course, the plural for having a Sukkah. Right? I have a Sukkah, you have a Sukkah, we have Sukkot. Why in the world are we building Sukkot? Uh, well, there is the basic answer, which is the Torah says to. Uh, it tells us very clearly in the Torah reading that we had this morning for our service that uh, we will have these dwellings for a week uh, during this time in order to commemorate the dwellings we lived at, lived in rather, when we left the land of Egypt. I know everybody always imagine us, uh, always in these beautiful Ar Arabic tents. Uh, we did not have time to uh, go to Tents R Us and stock up before we left Egypt. We left, and that meant that we did what people around the world have done and continue to do. Uh, we roughed it. Uh, we built what you might call a lean-to, a hut, whatever you want to describe it as. We built Sukkot in that wilderness area when we left. And we put our fabric into building the Mishkan, into the tabernacle, and maybe over time we accumulated a little bit through trade to have larger tents. But by and large, we were living in these little huts. Now there is a perk to living in a hut. Uh, it's not the ventilation, although this year it's been pretty good. Uh, it's not the uh, closeness you have with uh, the natural world, uh, although in Florida that natural world usually comes on buzzing wings and biting mouths. It is humility that it's hard to feel high and mighty when you are sitting in a hut. It is hard to feel full of yourself when your roof is falling in on you and leaves are getting in your food and you're just curling up in this state of vulnerability. And that vulnerability is part of the point. Uh, not just because it reminds us to be humble, although the Torah is very clear that that's a, an important human reflection, but because we are now at the tail end of the Yamim Noraim, the days of awe. And although we have um, marked Yom Kippur as the chief moment for repentance and turning and, uh, and, and going back to God with a humble heart, our tradition says that in fact there is still a crack in the gates of repentance even up until the end of this holiday season. So by putting ourselves in a hut, we are sort of demonstrating to God our humility. We are demonstrating to God that, you know, we don't really have much, right? I'm just living in a hut. Don't punish me, God. What are you going to do, knock my hut over? Our hut in the back got pretty permished, but it's almost as though we are pleading with God for mercy by putting ourselves in this vulnerable state. And we're all very good at that. That is to say, individually, when we've done something wrong, we are very good at pleading for forgiveness and mercy. We are very good at rationalizing our behavior and uh, explaining it. In fact, there have been some researchers who have argued that sentience as a whole, the human conscious mind, is nothing more than an elaborate rationalization machine. That in order to maintain our social cohesion, we had to come up with good excuses for why we had done something wrong to the other members of the tribe. And the people who did that better were able to flourish in the tribe better. And so we developed our whole conscious mind, our prefrontal cortex, just to be able to come up with good excuses. And so we are very good at that. And you'll find that if anybody ever challenges you on something of, why didn't you finish this on time? Why did you do shoddy work on that? Why did you say this insulting thing? The first thing your mind is going to do is say, well, it wasn't that bad. I didn't really do it. You misunderstood. Let me explain. You're going to kick in all of those amazing gears into, uh, into high speed in order to explain yourself. But there is a problem, which is to say that uh, as we explain, we're not that bad. Look, I'm in this hut. Look at how vulnerable and humble I am. We don't often have the same enthusiastic engagement of our capacity for, for thought and imagination when we are considering someone else's point of view. That is to say, when it comes to explaining myself, 
I have all the power of a giant supercomputer between my ears, and I will argue until I'm blue in the face why what I did wasn't as bad as you think it was. But when I am upset with someone else, when they have wronged me in my perception, I will immediately simplify everything that has taken place into the most trite, most cartoon, most cliché explanation of their wickedness. They will be cast with the twirling mustache, with the, uh, the, the, the cape and cloak. They will be glaring over their eyes in the worst melodramatic overacting that we can possibly find. Well, why is that? Why is it for ourselves that we can plead for mercy so eloquently, but for someone else, we want only justice? We want to throw the book at them. If God were to throw the book at us, as we often say is the, uh, the role of the adversary, Satan, uh, arguing that we should be treated with strict justice, <coughs> as our tradition says, none of us could stand. And yet, when we treat each other, we often treat those that have wronged us as though they are only deserving of justice, whereas we are deserving of mercy. We see this time and time again. My speeding is justified. Your speeding is reckless. My bluntness is needed because I'm a straight talker. Your bluntness is rudeness and insulting. My use of expletives is merely exaggeration and hyperbole. Yours is cursing and swearing. Time and time again, we have one standard for ourselves, which excuses our mistakes, and a different standard for someone else, which will condemn them for even things that have been done more lightly, more gently, than we ourselves have done in similar circumstances. Sukkot puts us all in the same hut. Sukkot says no. It's not about being in a glass house, it's about being in a grass house. And it's not about throwing stones, it is about recognizing that we are all vulnerable, we are all flawed, we are all humble people in the most basic of senses. We may not always act like it, but we should treat everyone as though they are so. Because no matter how much someone has wrapped themselves up in the, the mantle of their righteousness or the arrogance of their position, ultimately, they're just some nebbish trying to get through life in a small little hut. They're just some schmo that is doing whatever they're doing, usually out of very flawed motivations and with very flawed understanding of what will help themselves or, or those around them just like each of us do on an almost daily basis. And so when we look at them and we see their mistakes, we have to look at them not as being the mustache-twirling melodrama villain, but as being another one of our people stuck in a hut, trying to figure out what to do, and making a mess of it. And rather than throwing aspersions at them, we should engage that explanation uh, element of our mind and say, why might they have done this? What is the motivation? What flaw in their reasoning or in their current emotional state led them to behave this way? Not because they are that melodrama villain, but just because they're human. And the same way that I can explain my own mistakes and then hopefully try to find a better explanation and answer for them, so too I can do that for someone else. Because it is not enough to simply plead for forgiveness from God to do teshuva for ourselves we have to be prepared as well to extend forgiveness to others. And the first step into being able to give someone else forgiveness is to be able to understand that they have uh, messed up like anyone that is trying to uh, stumble through in this hut-like existence. Now, does that mean that justice does not have a place? Of course, justice, we are Jews, always has a place. But we can administer justice still with understanding. And we can recognize that in most circumstances, what we actually need is mercy and compassion for one another. And justice can come only if unavoidable as a final, uh, a final answer to repeated problems. First and foremost, give them the same explanatory effort that you would give to yourself and see if it doesn't help relieve some of that stress and pressure within yourself and Maybe you'll be a little bit more comfortable in your hut during this uh, week of Sukkot. Shabbat Shalom and Moadim Lasimcha.